1 Peter 2 from verse 18. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourself to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering, because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Do I encourage you to keep that open in front of you? I know that's a little bit hard when you've got a device that sort of powers itself off, but uh, if you've got a, a Bible, keep it in front of you so that we can refer to it as we go along. Well, George McFly, father of Marty McFly from Back to the Future. He was a timid, geeky, unsure of himself, bullied young man. He had Biff come along and tell him to do his homework for him, made fun of him, got him to pay for things. And so when he finally stands up for himself and he protects the girl, Lorraine, who became his wife, we kind of give out a, a cheer inside. Yes! He stood up for himself as he knocks Biff out with one punch. Maybe you're not familiar with Back to the Future, but it's the sort of story that's told over and over again. It's kind of the, a plot line that comes in umpteen movies and so on, isn't it? And we kind of get this sense, yes, when it finally happens, they stood up for themselves, they put things right. The idea of sort of submitting to someone, just putting up with mistreatment, uh, especially when it's unfair, it goes against our natural inclination, doesn't it? We want justice. We want things to be put right. And, and so we're, we're quick to defend ourselves. I know I'm quick to defend myself when I feel like something is unfair. I know we, we can find ourselves going over it in our mind, spending hours and hours contemplating how can we make this situation turn out better the way we want it to turn out. We perhaps talk over our problems with others. We're struggling with something and maybe we don't feel like we can actually put the situation right, but we'll talk to someone else and we'll get the kind of the vindication of at least having someone on our side. Yes, they think we're right. And perhaps that's you now. Maybe you're going through a challenge, some situation in life, in work, in family, whatever, and it's unfair. Someone's not treating you right and you wrestle with that. And you think, how can I make this turn out? I don't like this injustice. And so when Peter comes along and he says what, he's, what we've just read, he says, submit, even in the face of injustice. Well, naturally, the, the objections start to flow, don't they? I mean, I said, hey, hang on, this isn't going to work. What are you saying? That we should just, like, are we just going to make people into doormats? This is unfair. Isn't it right that we should seek justice? Doesn't God care about justice and putting things right? But Peter's essentially saying, look, when you put God in the picture, there's, there's something desirable about leaving justice in his hands. There's something commendable about that, and that's what we're going to reflect on this morning. Now, note that some people object to passages such as this, just talking about slaves and say, well, the Bible's actually sort of endorsing slavery. Maybe that's an objection that you've had. Maybe you explore things, you sort of feel like, yeah, I don't know, I'd like that question answered. Does the Bible endorse slavery? Seems like it perhaps does. But he's speaking into a situation that was the experience of so many in the culture to which he's writing. Slavery was kind of the way that the, 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 the culture, the, the society functioned. And many of the roles that today would be jobs that you would do as an employee would have been done by slaves. Uh, 
not all were the kind of idea of slaves as a time of sla- um, chain gangs and help, uh, abused and mistreated. Uh, many of them would have enjoyed a reasonable amount of freedom. Nonetheless, not all of them did, of course, that's why it says, even if you're mistreated, even if you've got a harsh master. He's not endorsing slavery any more than he's ultimately endorsing injustice. He's not endorsing slavery any more than he's saying, look, it was right for people to put the Son of God to death, in terms of the example of Jesus. He's addressing an appropriate response to a a quite typical situation that that so many of the people faced. So the closest parallel for today, uh, for our own experience, uh, the reality is, as we heard from IJM a a few weeks ago, uh, slavery is still rife in our world even today. But it's not really our experience, is it? So the closest uh, parallel for us is probably employers and employees. You probably think, well, that feels about right. I feel like a bit of a slave when I'm at work. Uh, but let's not make it too close. But nonetheless, and the, the principles that he deals with here apply more broadly than just employers and employees. Perhaps students to a, a teacher that they feel like, or, or a supervisor, I feel like this teacher, this supervisor is not marking me fairly. Not treating me fairly. Maybe you're running a small business and you interact with a a bigger corporation and they're hounding you out of business. This This is not fair. Maybe there's unfair treatment going on in the playground or or online. If people are maligning you and bullying you. Maybe it plays out in terms of a husband and a wife relationship, which will come up more specifically in chapter three. We'll get to that next time. But the principles dealt with here flow through into what we'll talk about next time. It's broadly applicable. And when we take this path that leaves justice in God's hands, that leaves vindication to Him, it's pleasing to God. He says there in verse 20, it is commendable before God. He cares. He can do things with that context in which we're entrusting ourselves to Him. It stands out as trusting God rather than trusting ourselves. We're trying to answer the question ourselves and deal with it by ourselves. When we trust in Him, it stands out. God starts to look good. I've known people over time who've uh, in, taken on board those um, diet programs where you, they, they provide the food for you. They provide you healthy food and you're supposed to eat just what they give you. Things like light and easy and so on. And uh, you know, our obvious question with those things is, do they work, isn't it? And unfortunately we see... On the ads, you know, these people enjoying these great healthy meals and they're slim and trim and whatever, but probably the people on those ads have never had to lose weight in their lives. Or if if they're a bit of a health Nazi, then they're probably doing all sorts of things. And you ask the question, is it really the food? Is it just light and easy that's making all the difference? We want to know if it matters, don't we? And so when we're solving the problem ourselves, who are we pointing to? So when we leave it in God's hands, he starts to look good. It's clear that he's at work. And there's two important things that we want to see as to why we would submit even in the face of injustice. Rather than fight back, rather than make things right ourselves. Two things to see. First of all is following Jesus' example. That's a core thing that Peter points us to. Follow Jesus' example. Because in Enduring injustice, in suffering for doing what is right, that is to follow Jesus' example. And by following his example, we reflect him to others. So this is what Jesus did, I'm his follower, and people start to see something of Jesus in our actions. You see, Jesus died for us to take the penalty for us so that we wouldn't have to. That we wouldn't have to take that penalty. And that's uh, crystallized in verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. This is called uh, vicarious atonement. Uh, the, The vicarious means on behalf of another. So Jesus takes the penalty on behalf of another, on behalf of those who follow him. This vicarious atonement does not imply vicarious suffering. 
Sometimes we're inclined to think that sometimes that message seems to go out. If I get Jesus in my life, then things will start to play out well. I'll follow him. He tells me the right way to live and everything's going to start falling into place. Life's going to go really well. He said, no, that's actually not how it works. You follow Jesus' journey and you'll suffer like him. He doesn't just take that for you. The Christian message asserts that people are fundamentally in rejection against God, like in opposition to God. And maybe we find that a little bit hard to kind of get our heads around. I don't know. I don't really feel necessarily that opposed to God. Like, and you talk to the average person in the street, oh, I'm not that much of a sinner, but I, I don't necessarily reject God. But here we see actually sort of empirical evidence of this reality that our fundamental orientation is to reject God. Because what happens when God comes to earth? God came in the person of Jesus. And how did people respond? Yeah, some followed him, but by and large, they rejected him. And so those that then follow him and choose to orient their life around Jesus, what's the response? So often, it's actually that humanity plays out its hostility to God in being hostile to Jesus' followers. How did Jesus face that? Well, he was... He did no wrong at all. Verse 22, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. And so therefore, as he was condemned by people and put to death, he suffered the ultimate injustice. It wasn't just that he didn't quite deserve the, the extent of what was dished out. He didn't deserve anything at all. It's the ultimate injustice. And how did he face that ultimate injustice? Without retaliating, without making threats, without trying to prove his innocence. He was sinless and he bore our guilt so that we, though sinful, that in hostility to God, might actually live for righteousness. That's the, that's the great, that, that great exchange. Jesus, the innocent one, for us, the guilty one, so that we might actually be innocent. That's, that great exchange is the hope of the Christian gospel, so that we might be re, reunited to God. Verse 25, for you were like sheep going astray, but you've returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. That great exchange is the hope of the Christian gospel and that great transformation from sinner to being pursuing righteousness is the intent. That's God's purpose. It's important that we don't get those things the wrong way around. The righteousness that follows from the reality that produces it. Friends of ours have got a boat and uh, they also sometimes they just use it for fishing quite often, but uh, they've also got a, a tube which they can string out on a rope. It's like water skiing, but on, on a tube uh, or a kneeboard, uh, and you can follow the boat and, and go in the water. And our kids had a go at it, and uh, one of them in particular, the guy on the boat, he was really trying hard to get the kid into the water, throw him off the tyre. And he was going, swinging backwards and forwards, taking great turns, and she clung on for all she was worth. And they couldn't throw her off. She stuck to the tube. She was sore for days afterwards from all the muscles expended trying to hold on, but at least she had the, the, the victory of not being ending up in the water. Uh, I think perhaps he bought the kneeboard because he couldn't get the claw marks out of the tube. But um, here's the thing. You can't get it the wrong way around. The boat pulls the tube. You try and put it the other way around, it does not end well for anybody because the boat's going to run over the tube. We can't get the gospel the wrong way around. Where does the righteousness come from? It comes from God. He achieves it first. And then as a result of that, it creates it in our life. It is not the other way around. And when, it, when we put it the other way around, it gets messy. It all falls apart. It's not that we pursue righteousness so as to be where God is. Jesus is our saviour, condemned though righteous, so that we might not be condemned though we are unrighteous. And so that we might become righteous following his example. That's the first thing to say. It's about following Jesus Example. And somewhat paradoxically, this submission that 
Peter calls us to. The second thing we want to see is that actually, sort of as a bit of a paradox, it's liberating. Sounds like it's just enslavement. No, it's, it's liberating. The second thing is about keeping focused on God. That's where he points it, keeping focused on God. The key is to keep God in centre view. What, what perspective do we have as we face injustice, as we face this suffering? It's about trusting in him. It's about waiting upon him. So verse 19, why do we do it? Well, it's commendable when we bear up under unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. And verse 23, talking about Jesus who went through this injustice and experienced this, how could he do that? Because he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He said, I'm going to leave it in his hands. He's going to work it all out. And I'm going to pursue this path of following his will. And so therefore, as we face situations with an unjust master or an unfair employer or a bully in the playground or in the workplace or an abusive, oppressive husband, they don't ultimately control you when we've got this perspective. We say, you are not my enslaver, you are not my master, God is my master, and I endure this in obedience to him, not to you. And so it's, it's, this submission, this being subject, is out of fear of God, a reverence for God, rather than a, a fear of the oppressor, a, a terror. My life is controlled, I'm a victim. No, I, I follow the Lord. And so it's by choice, in obedience to God, in his strength, facing the injustice, Knowing that God knows, God cares, God will commend the one who endures doing what is right and, and endures suffering for doing what is right. And that's why people will see God revealed as we endure such suffering in, the, in that sort of gracious mindset. They're going to they're gonna look and they're going to say, there's something here. There's something that I cannot explain here in terms of this person's response. It's not coming from themselves, not coming from a natural inclination. And so God becomes honoured. There's a, a group called Mercy Me, written a song called Even If. And it just expresses this trust to have in the midst of that situation that's, that's not right, not fixed. Speaking essentially as a prayer to God, he says, I know you're able and I know you can save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. I know the sorrow and I know the hurt would all disappear, sorry, all go away if you just say the word. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. You've been faithful, you've been good all my days. Jesus, I will cling to you, come what may, because I know you're able. I know you can. That's an expression of the sort of trust we're talking about in the midst of the, the, the unjust circumstances. Like Jesus, verse 23, we entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. We leave it in his hands, knowing that justice will be done in the end. God is watching it doesn't escape his notice. And as Jesus teaches in the account of his life uh, told by, by Luke, he says in, in Luke chapter 12, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. And so therefore, what is commendable before God, verse 20, the person who, in obedience to God, submits to injustice and leaves it in his, in his hands, that will be honoured. God is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You endured much in obedience to me. The spirit-empowered life being lived out, grace on display in strength and endurance and trust and confidence. Reflecting God so that God gets the glory. And so therefore, in contrast, what is unjust, what is oppressive, will be judged, will be dealt with. God has noticed. 
He's going to deal with it. He's going to triumph over it. But maybe you've got the question, but hang on. What if the person who's the oppressor is actually a believer? It'd be nice if we could say that no one who professes to be a Christian, no one who is actually a Christian, would ever oppress someone and would ever do something harmful. What then? Am I suggesting that at that last day, God's actually going to say, well, actually, no, Jesus' death wasn't good enough for you because you did this. Perish the thought. I'm not saying that. Jesus' death is sufficient for all. As the, one of the newer songs we've got, there is no sinner beyond the infinite stretch of your mercy. God can forgive in Jesus. But in that case, when everything is made known, we will look and we will marvel at God's grace. So we say, look at who that person truly was. Look at what they did to others. The fact that God can save such a nasty piece of work means God's grace is absolutely amazing. And God will again get the glory. That reality is sobering for those of us who might be in positions of dominance or leadership. It is a warning for any who might be abusers. You do not have the protection of Scripture. Either way, God will be, get, God will be glorified. Whether by His grace being worked out in humble, obedient submission, or whether by us looking and saying, boy, how much grace was necessary. How incredible is God's forgiveness. Willingly submitting and enduring injustice rather than fighting back and securing justice for ourselves goes against our natural inclination. We want justice. We want things put right. And so this is radical, what we're talking about. It's so radical, it stands out, it reflects Jesus. And people go, there's something here I can't explain any other way. But, and this is a big but, I need, I need you to get this, and if you've tuned out, then please tune back in again. We need to get this. We've, this is not the whole story. Submitting to injustice is radical, it points people to Jesus, but what Peter is pointing out is not the whole story. It's not an absolute. Like in every situation, you must just wear it like some holier path. It's not like we go looking for situations of hardship. Yeah, bring it on. Some sort of, some sort of weird, deranged kind of looking for suffering. And, and we'll just stay in it. We'll remain in it because that's the holier path. That's not what he's saying. Peter's giving tremendous comfort for those who are going to face suffering and unfair situations that are beyond your control. How can you endure that when it's not going to be put right? Put your trust in God. Recognize he's going to put it right. That doesn't mean we look for it. And so as Paul writes in, to the church in Corinth, he's addressing slaves as well. And he says, don't worry about your situation of slavery, but of being slaves. He says, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although, if you can gain your freedom, then do so. Like If, if, if that's that opportunity to get out of the situation, then take advantage of that, that opportunity. Likewise for other situations of abuse and oppression that we might be under. And it's like you have to keep just putting up with it when there's a, a way out. Like Take the way out. But for the one who entrusts themselves to him who judges justly, the one who sits there saying, look, I can't solve this problem, I have to leave it to God. God may not intend that his justice is going to wait until the last day before he brings it about. He might intend that you are going to be the means of enacting his justice for someone else. Maybe it's a friend who's in an abusive marriage, and you're going to come alongside them, and you're going to support them, you say, look, you need to get out of this situation, and I'm behind you all the way. Maybe it's, someone, maybe it's a child who you learn is, is suffering abuse. I'm going to be behind you all the way. I'm going to be your defender. We, we heard from IJM a few weeks ago. 
about the, the slavery that's rife in our world. Maybe we're going to support something like I, James. So I'm going to be the means of God bringing about justice in the lives of others because they don't have it. It's part of loving one another, which we're called to do. Loving one another practically, I will be your defender. Sadly, churches and, and, and Christians have often done poorly at this, which has led to so many people being hurt. So often we respond to situations that are abusive and oppressive and we, we, we disbelieve the victim. Oh, I, I can't imagine that so-and-so would do that. And we, we, naive to the reality of sin. Sometimes we've just sought to protect the, the offender's reputation. Oh, think what this will do. Think what a great person they've been. This is going to ruin them. Sometimes we insist on, on this taking a passage like this and saying, oh, well, we've really just got to forgive. We've just got to submit. So just, just keep going. Sometimes, maybe, in the context of marriage, we've got a high view of marriage. We want to establish marriage as something important. We don't want it to be lightly dispensed with, so we want to preserve that at all costs, and we send the person back to be a victim. And if that's you, if you've been through that, if you've been a victim and you haven't been supported, then... I'm sorry that that's been your story. I, I can't say sorry in terms of I wasn't necessarily involved in how it happened. That would be kind of a meaningless apology. But, but it grieves me. I'm grieved if, if that's where you're at, that you haven't been supported with, by those that you ought to have been. Too often we end up protecting the perpetrator at the expense of the victim who needs our protection. But God cares about the oppressed. And so as his people, we ought to care about them too. Nothing we've covered, nothing that Peter says here should be understood to imply that we should encourage people to stay in situations of abuse and injustice if there's a way out, as if it's some sort of holier path to just stay the course. So if, in our culture at least, separation and divorce is a real possibility... In an abusive marriage, that might be the path you take. In, in a situation where your boss is treating you unfairly, if you can get another job, then get another job. God might intend to use you as a means of granting justice to another. You might be his agent to free the oppressed. But as Christ follow, followers... Nonetheless, the reality is there'll be all sorts of situations where we will face unjust circumstances that we can't avoid, that we can't get out of. We'll face those because we follow in Jesus' footsteps. And in such cases, then we can know that God cares. We can know that following him obediently through that is, is commendable to him. And he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. And, and we can pursue it knowing that he will put things right. He can leave justice in his hands. And as we follow that path, this expression of God's grace working out in our lives will reveal Jesus. It will reflect Jesus. That strength, that, that, that quiet strength, that perspective, that, that grace that has no ordinary source. Because we're conscious of God and entrusting ourselves to him who judges justly. Mindful that our saviour endured a much greater injustice. He endured the, the ultimate injustice. He was totally sinless and yet he was condemned for us. And he did that willingly because he certainly had the power to get out of it. He could have changed the situation and said, no, I'm not putting up with this. But he didn't. He didn't. He did it for us. And that encourages us in those circumstances where we face a situation that we really wish was different and we want to change. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we, we thank you for this example of Jesus. Thank you for this reality that he endured injustice for us so that we might be able to be in relationship with you and, and made righteous. Lord, help us to exhibit this grace. This doesn't come naturally. When we face hardship, when we face difficulty, we'd rather solve it. We'd rather answer the question, get justice done and done now. Lord, help us to keep 
you in view. Help us to put you in the center of our view so that we can live what you want us to live. But Lord, also help us to recognize that maybe what you want us to live is to stand up for someone else, is to to deal with the injustice that they're facing. Lord, help us to be aware of that. Help us to be courageous in that. Help us to work out our love in that. But Lord, for all this, it, 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 it's overwhelming. It, it's, it's, it's something that doesn't come naturally. It's something we so often fall short of. We so often don't have the courage for. Uh, we so often complain about, Lord, we need your grace. We need you to be working in us by your spirit so that we can, do, we can act in such a way that cannot come about through any other means. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen.